Not really got that much time, so we're going to like cram through a lot of stuff and hopefully show bits of the game at the end um, if we get time. But we're going to have the, the machine around today, so if people are interested afterwards, come and grab us and we'll, we'll, we'll show you some of the, the actual game stuff. So, um, this is our, our company. Um, this is the people basically the kind of core of the company. Um, we've got a very official title, that's the proper photograph of us as well, obviously. Um, this is our organisational structure. <laughs> we uh, use the feudal system, but we've run out of surf to the minute. Oh, we've all got some sort of disease. Um, this is our um, advanced game design document, which features an appointment for a haircut for me in it, which uh, is good. Um, so, right, so what we're going to talk about is um, why we're we using procedural technology to, to, to create the game that we're making. Um, and there's a bunch of different reasons for that, so I'm going to quickly go through some of them and explain why. Um, I'm a, a kind of coder, that's sort of my background, and if I do art, it looks like that. Um, which it isn't that, that hot, really, to be honest. And sometimes I'm doing something and I can't get hold of anyone to do nice graphics. So I end up using code to make the graphics instead, because I can code. So if I get code to make graphics, then I will do that. Because it essentially means I can get on with shit without having to worry about um, getting hold of the kind of the, all the sort of you know, luscious visual kind of uh, stuff off someone else. Um, so that's just sort of led me on, me personally, to using procedural content. Um, and it's something that we use a lot in Big Robot making so. Um There's a bunch of reasons why it's, it's useful in a lot of different ways, and I think these are particularly relevant to small developers or indie developers because we just don't have the resources a lot of people have. But that doesn't necessarily stop us having the kind of ambitions and the kind of, I guess, the sort of um, the scope or vision of what we want to do. It's quite hard sometimes to kind of keep that small, even though you know you really should. And so. Procedural content generation allows us to sort of get away with trying to be a bit more ambitious um, and, and using technology to kind of solve the problems. So it allows us to do stuff like I don't have to spend you know, every day placing every single brick or petal in the world. I can get the code to do that for me. Um, we can have um, <coughs> permutations, so we can have many, many different versions of the same sort of game. Um, and each time there's a slight difference. So it means there's a great deal of replayability to it. It means it's automated. There's a kind of depth in terms of the numbers of kind of uh, immersion events that you can get. Um, the other thing that's nice is it's not a perfect program, so it's not like you play it once and there's one solution and you've got it. Or even within a single game, it's not like there's one way there to do something. There's always a lot of different options that you can kind of play through. This does, of course, mean that some games might be actually easier than others, but that's fine, you know, that's okay. It's, it offers you the different experiences. Um, it also offers you that novelty and that surprise that you might not get if you're hand designing everything. Um, I'll probably mention later some of the kind of, uh, I guess they're not really mistakes, but they kind of are bugs that have, uh, have occurred in the game. And, but some of them, you know, we actually want to embrace, like, hey, that looks pretty cool. We didn't expect that to work like that, but it's an interesting thing. And you can find that just even when you're going through the game, there'll be little areas that have been generated in quite an unusual way. Um, and that's quite nice. Um, the other reason I like it from a programming point of view is that it kind of shows a bit more of the process of how games are made, or it's sort of, you can see a little bit of the code itself in action. So you can kind of look at the world, and every time you play, you can think, oh, so that's how it's doing it, and I'd only get these items in this particular area, and so on. So it kind of lets you into a little bit of the system by allowing the system to constantly be sort of replayed and rerun. Um, another thing that should be nice about it is that it, uh, it gives players a sort of sense of ownership. It's like, this is my world, I've generated it, it's mine, it's something that's sort of unique to me. Um, and at the same time, it's a kind of collaboration between the designers, us, and the player, because we give them access to change various aspects about how the world is made, so they can kind of tailor make it in a sense. So it's almost like a collaborative thing. We say, here's the tools to sort of make your world and your game. You can choose how you want to do that. Now, obviously, we have to kind of put some limitations on that, otherwise people would be making worlds that were just full of um, water towers and nothing else. Um, which might look kind of cool, but would be hideously broken in terms of gameplay. So it's a kind of like collaboration or push and pull. Um, the other thing that's nice about it is you get this kind of panning for gold and the time when you're playing it, that you know somewhere in the world there is an axe, there's some traps, there is a map, there is some kind of kick ass objects that you want to get hold of. And you begin to learn the kind of um, I guess the distribution of those things. And so you're kind of searching, it's almost like you're planning for gold, trying to find those kind of events and those items. 
Okay, so on to, on to the game. I'm going to do a little bit of technical stuff just because I thought there'll be people here who might be interested to see from that point of view. So it's easy to say procedural content generation and people go, yeah, yeah, great, but what actually, actually are you doing? So, um, we wanted to make an open world survival FPS game. Um, and that's something that's pretty ambitious for essentially just three people um, who aren't all full time either. So, we realised we couldn't really do this without using procedural content generation. Um, so, uh, some programming maths terms, blah blah blah. Um, Romy diagrams, look at that, that's nice, isn't it? That's some maths, makes a nice pattern. Um, but I, I, we kind of looked at this and thought, we want to make a game about the English countryside. Ooh, look, it looks a little bit like fields. Let's mess around with it a little bit more, and then we can use it to actually generate fields. So, we took like a number of different traditional procedural content techniques. Um, to create an island, and then we use these for, uh, Voronoi diagrams to kind of partition the island up into things that looked a bit like English fields. And then we went a bit further on that, we were like, okay, oh, see that's, that's it, forced into a hex grid, just for fun. Um, so then we, once we've made the island, we can kind of mix and match the different uh, procedural kind of uh, uh, methods to give it like beaches by the coast and rocks at, at a higher altitudes and so on mix and match those things together, kind of blur them around a bit to give it an organic sort of feel. And, and then you end up with something that looks a little bit like this. So this is an overview of the island with a lot of the objects highlighted. And you can see that there's all these different the shapes that are different regions in the islands. And some of them have got trees in, some of them have got rocks in, some of them have villages. And all those regions sort of add to the kind of dynamic variety of, of, of the world itself. And the kind of events and, uh, I guess, gameplay that can happen within them. Uh, I'm going to really quickly look at the village region here. So this is an example of how I do one, one region. So this is the, the simple village. So it starts off by taking a region that's particularly, has to be a reasonable size. It plants an object in the middle of it and it defines a number of rows. It makes sure those rows don't go too close to each other, otherwise you end up with people's back gardens inside other people's houses, which isn't good. Um, so stick an object in the middle of it, then it steps out along the roads and either side it places houses. Um, along those roads. You can even see there's a bit of an error here. I could use the pipe now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> where those houses are slightly intersecting. So we're still kind of sort of tweaking this system to try and get rid of at least some of those. Um, then it goes on to sort of placing objects in the back gardens behind the houses. So there's little walls and fences and so on. Then there's a bunch of stuff that actually goes in the garden themselves, like bushes, trees, benches, chairs, broken objects and so on. And then all of those objects together sort of constitute the, the village itself. So it's just a sort of an, a way of iterating on something that's quite simple and then just sort of building into it a, a depth of variety and possibility that means that what you'll end up with is something that does look kind of nice. So that's the isometric view and this is some of the images of what it might look like uh, actually within the gameplay. Um, so we've got a, a bunch of regions. Yeah, we've got like a, a bunch of different region types, um, ranging from really simple things just like beaches that only have a bit of driftwood and rocks in them to villages which are a lot more complex. And we're adding more of those all the time. Um, the current sort of state of that is that we're, we're able to sort of define uh, thematically different islands. We might have a, a mountainous island that's more like to have pine trees on it, or a, a fen like island that's at a low level, with lots of watery kind of areas and so on. Um, and that gives us the sort of ability to create thematically sets of different region types and so on. And um, it's really nice because you can basically just sit there and tweak with these values all day. I mean, I'm not going to say this is like a magic solution that you just have to write this and it takes you half a day and then you get done brilliant. It's like you have to spend a lot of time kind of tweaking and fine tuning the system and making sure this model doesn't work and that model doesn't work. And uh, James will like Skype me up every day and go, oh, you, you've got a house in a tree today, Tom, or like a. Uh, you know, there's walls growing horizontally out of cliffs and things like that. Trying to find, try to find a system that's flexible enough for people to be able to play with it themselves, and then, but not so flexible that you can break it as a player. So you've still got some flexibility to create your own wires, but not, not so much that it breaks the whole system. Yes, right. Um, so yeah, you get these, these, these nice environments that are generated, and then we, we get obviously these kind of issues. So we've had things like there's been terrain objects floating in the air, We've had, um, but as part of the world being generated, it also generates ambient wildlife. So there's trees, um, 
uh, which James designed actually, that we have a, a problem with the wire because they're constantly emitting birds. Um, <laughs> the plan of birds was they'd be an indicator for the player to know if there was movement in the world. It's a completely open world, so if you've got uh, enemies moving around, you want to be able to spot where they are in the landscape without properly. Not necessarily being able to see them. So if they walk through a field uh, with sort of trees in it, they get close enough to the sub the birds, the birds are far, if you can see the birds, you know what they are. The trouble was, the birds also made noise themselves, which then scared other birds, which then scared other birds, and so you had like a, a Mexican wave of birds going across the island, which was quite good. A uh, similar thing to that, uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. It was the dogs doing the same. We had a, we had dogs that would listen for part, would listen for noise, and then go and investigate. The yeah, I guess. Yeah, sorry, that's that. Yeah, so they go and they go and find the owners. Um, so each dog, each dog when it spawns, assigns itself uh, an owner in the in the, the, the collection of NPCs and heads for that owner. But we forgot to exclude dogs from that. So dogs were assigning o dog, other dogs as their owners and then going to them. And then they'd end up as a big pack of them up in the mountains somewhere, hiding from everybody, being quite happy on their own, forming little dog packs rather than going off and hunting people, which was a plan. Yeah, so you get quite a lot of these interesting things. The dog packs was great. Now, I would quite like to leave them in. I had this romantic vision of these dogs like, up in the hills on their own. Didn't we give a shit about you? Just hang out. Um, and you also have these really nice, uh, I forgot what the Disney film is, the, where, the, where the dogs come home from like thousands of miles. Occasionally you get that where a dog's owner would be like, Across, completely across the other side of the island. And you can stand on a hill and watch this dog in the distance running really fast trying to get home to its own. And if you're in the way, it would come up to you, like savage you violently, and then just carry on. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> going back to their owners. Yeah. So they don't just stay on all the time. So if their owners miles away, they just stop briefly to attack you and then carry on their journey. So we have all kinds of issues. We, you know, we've had books like that, and it makes, this is what makes it really fun as well. We've had underwater villages, villages on vertical cliffs. We even had an issue a few weeks back where if you put a gun that you were carrying inside a house, you could carry on shooting it while it was in the house. Because you can stash that. So, uh, yeah, there you go. That's an example of some flying hedgerows that I had there. That got some work out to do. That's a village that's sort of submerged. Um, so, what's the time? Should we show that? Maybe we should show a little bit, and I'll talk a little bit about the, the sort of AI system and so on. So. <coughs> right. Um, so in the in the world, there's a number of well, it depends which how you set it up really, but generally you'll find these villages. Um, we've got a number of different villages. This is kind of one star. We've got kind of industrial villages, and there's other areas where you can find. Um, uh, resources and items. So all the houses are, as you saw earlier, they're all dropped in the world, and then um, that the they have loot that's also procedurally generated in them. So if you go up to one of the houses, you can check out what's in the doors. Uh, you can drag stuff into your inventory and, and make use of various different types of uh, of resources. So you can eat to uh, replenish your vitality. You can uh, find bandages to stop you from bleeding to death. It's quite a bleak game, actually. <laughs> Whenever a gym tends to post anything about it, it's like, this is brilliant, I'm, I'm bleeding to death in a ditch. It's like, uh, hey, yeah, it's the sort of game you like, you know. So, like, it's pitch dark and there's things shooting me, I'm just dying. Um, <laughs> there will be kind of difficulty settings, so people will be uh, allowed to kind of uh, edit those sort of uh, different aspects. There you go, there's some birds flying up in the trees. There's, oh, two minutes, yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, kind of emergent stuff in there. Even the NPCs don't really have the, any kind of scripted behaviour. They, they wander around in troops around the islands, and then certain NPCs don't actually like each other either. So they're highly likely to get, get into fights with each other, which you can use to your advantage to try and, uh, you know, get around them to get to some sort of location where you need. Oh, there's a little wisp there for the guy in the forest. Sometimes they help you, and sometimes they'll just lead you over a cliff. So um, you've got to be careful. Okay, um, well, thanks very much. I think we're out of time. If you want to grab me or James, it shouldn't be too hard to spot us. Yeah, it's um, So, um, like, if you want to come up and have a play. Yeah, so thanks for listening. Toodle pick. <laughs>